Hello YouTube. My name's Anthony Pepper and welcome along. Uh, Mike Coates is here, Quentin Dwyer is here, Ian Bradley is here and we'll be back after we've heard The Prowling Cat. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Duke. Ian, so that was the prowling cat Duke Ellington in London in 1965. Yes, um, a, a rehearsal session for um, a programme called Ellington in Europe that the BBC put out um, sometime in February of that year. So I think perhaps that's why Cat sounded perhaps a little bit tentative. Though well, he was always a high wire act, wasn't he? And uh, would say that's the one at the end of having achieved that really high note. Um, and when I was on the programme um, last July, uh, celebrating Paul Gonsalves' centenary, there wasn't room to put a couple of tracks in from albums he'd recorded in London with Tubby Hayes. So that got me thinking about that period in uh, the orchestra's career um, and thinking about putting together various recordings around that, that era. So the theme is um, Duke Ellington in London and the recordings were all made in London that we're featuring today between 1958 and 1965. Um, and it's really good Quentin and Mike are here as uh, expert witnesses really as you would have seen Ellington live, wouldn't you? Which I, um, I can't imagine. I think if Duke Ellington walked in the door, apart from being quite surprised, to me it would be in his 60s that my go-to version of him is that period in his career, perhaps because there's so much more um, recorded material from that era. There's a lot more visual material. Mm. I, I, perhaps I, I, was, I was alive in the 60s, too young to see Ellington. Oh. Um, but it seems more attainable somehow than, than the earlier eras. And I do feel the music of that period tends to be a little bit overlooked as well. And I was surprised looking in the jazz press at the time um, when Ellington was doing his various tours to London, how 
quite how snooty they were and complacent about the fact that Duke Ellington and his orchestra were, were on these shores. Um, I've, I, I, I've got recordings from 1958 because I feel that's the, the start, really, of his mm. legacy in this country and certainly for the Ellington Society UK and those appearances are within living memory. Um, he was here, of course, initially in 1933 with his full orchestra. Um, and uh, legend has it, I think, that that visit to the UK and to the continent really strengthened his self-belief in his music, and it was a, a very historic occasion. And he, he came back again in 1948 with just Kay Davis and Ray Nance because of limitations, I think, in terms of the exchange of musicians between Britain and America. So it, it, he toured with a small group of British musicians then. Mm. So 1958 would have been... 25 years since the full orchestra was was in the UK um, and quite a momentous occasion, I think. Um, and it just gives a little bit of an extra kick sometimes listening to the music to know it was recorded almost locally. Uh, and definitely in the 50s and in, in into the 60s and into the 70s, I think anybody who admires Ellington's music, wherever they are in the world, could probably find somewhere not far away from where they live where his orchestra played during that period. Mm. So I'm unlikely to get to Newport, Rhode Island anytime soon, especially in present circumstances, but it would be possible to, to take a walk down Kilburn High Street to the <laughs> Goldmont State Theatre, where the, the next recording that we've got to listen to was, was made in October 1958. So it's from his first British tour in a quarter of a century, uh, and I chose the feature for Jimmy Hamilton and Quentin Jackson and Billy Strayhorn's arrangement of My Funny Valentine from the Kilburn <laughs> Theatre in 58. So now, um, Jimmy Hamilton returns to the microphone, this time along with Quentin Jackson in their tonal pantomime of My Funny Valentine. <laughs>
Jackson, <laughs> Jimmy Hamilton, clarinet. My Funny Valentine, the Ukrainian Orchestra in London in 1958. Yeah, um, and um, we were just having a conversation about the the venue there for Ellington being a, a, a cinema. Uh, rather than a dedicated um, concert hall. And also how, although there's often a perceived tension between pop music and jazz um, throughout the 50s and 60s, they were very much bedfellows because of that variety tradition. I found an interesting quotation, a a surprising source for this really, who um, was referring to the 1958 tour and focused for some reason in particular on Jimmy Hamilton's contributions. Um, My Funny Valentine was um, a feature from the album Duke Ellington Presents in 1956 uh, and um, Ellington was clearly featuring that in his concerts when he came to the continent and Jimmy Hamilton was featured in the same album on Deep Purple and then around about the time of the tour in 58 there was the album Ellington Indigos and again an Ellington uh, feature for Hamilton was Tenderly. Uh, This particular critic zeroed in on Tenderly and Deep Purple as numbers that Ellington was playing at the time. Uh, And he wrote, a year or so ago, we felt that a discerning jazz audience was in the process of creation here. The undiscriminating reaction and applause to Duke's programme painfully indicated that this was not so. It is a shock to realise that despite all the books, magazines and records, the audience of 1958 knows far less about jazz and its verities than that of 1933. So he really had a downer on this element of Ellington's music. Uh, And I was amazed to read that that was Stanley Dance who wrote that in Jazz Journal in uh, a month after the 58 tour. Um, There's always been a resistance to the more popular side of Ellington. Uh, And I I always felt that was limiting where he wanted to go as an artist 
and in reaching his audiences and the fact that he played in cinemas and the vast majority of those audiences I would think wouldn't have been great Ellington aficionado they were just members of the general public to whom Ellington's music meant something and it was his way of reaching out and it's surprising to see that limited view the idea I could go and see Ginny Hamilton in concert play My Funny Valentine would mm. make my head explode nowadays uh, so I was really surprised. I didn't find anything either light or polite about that column. <laughs> Mike, you were saying you really? saw Ellington in a, a, a cinema set in the Odeon. Uh, in that's, that, that's correct, yes. Yeah. Um, when, uh, when he was in Glasgow, which was the cinema setting I mentioned, he also played two concerts uh, that night uh, and... Uh, I guess that would be the same at, at his other appearances. They would uh, be invariably two yeah, performances two every evening. Yeah. Did you get that, Quentin? Yeah, yeah, there were two shows. I mean, uh, certainly the first time I saw him in 69, I was just turned 15, so I went to the early show. Uh, and I guess one of the other venues that it would that would crop up would be the Manchester Free Trades Hall, where all the big shows were. Is that where you used to go to, Ian? Oh, it's it's be before my time. I, I, the, the, the only um, real jazz legend I saw, in fact, uh, Dave Brubeck, I saw at the Free Trade Hall just before that shut down. That was in 1992, though. Oh, okay. Um, but, yeah, I'm aware. I know Peter Caswell, the former chairman of, of uh, Des UK, saw um, Ellington in 58 at the at Bellevue, which was a venue just outside Manchester, yeah. known better as a speedway track and circus. And I can't remember which venue in Manchester was unavailable, but the, the, the show had been moved there. So circuses and cinemas, and it, that was just how things were, wasn't it, in, in those uh, days? Now, now you've mentioned 58, that's the year I saw... Ellington at the City Hall, the public uh, ah, yes. hall in Sheffield. Yeah. Um, and there was a whole spate of, uh, well, concerts by people there. As I mentioned before, Herman and Count yeah. Basie and people like that. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, incidentally, is that microphone better now? Your okay. microphone's a bit loud now, actually, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll adjust it again. Better loud than never. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right. Thanks, for Anthony. No, so it's wonderful to have Mike and Quentin here, both witnesses to Ellington performing and specifically performing in Britain. In the case of Mike, I think not in London, but elsewhere, yeah. and, and Quentin in London uh, a bit later on. Uh, yes. Quentin, when did you first see the band? In, in 1969 at Hammersmith Gym, and then again, same place, 71, and then the Finsbury Park. In 73, is it 73? Last time you came over, anyway. Yes. Yes. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Yes, wonderful. Yeah, it really was the, the start of that, as I say, within living memory. And it, in fact, it was five years um, after 1958 before Ellington returned to the UK, though he did spend some time on the continent and Paris in particular in the, in the early 60s. It wasn't until 1963 that he came back um, to, to Britain. But his, his visits then were annual right through to 67. I'm not, I don't think he came over in 68. I might be mistaken. I don't think so. um, but again, certainly 69, 71 and 73. Um, but for that, that, that golden era of an, an annual uh, Ellington visit, and perhaps it was the way um, the management of the orchestra was arranged that always seemed to be February it was always although that it was October in 58 the first tour in a long time it was an annual thing in February for Ellington to to visit with his orchestra and equally amazingly um, Ellington appeared on British television every year for five years through 63 64 65 and 66 um, and we have a, a recording from the broadcast in 1963, if we, if we want to move in, in that direction now. Um, I, I've never seen video of this, um, this particular broadcast. The, the audio comes from one of the Mercer Ellington discs. It's called The Great London Concerts, which is a bit of a misnomer. 
because it was actually a television broadcast. And it was for Granada, which, of course, UK viewers will associate with Coronation Street and Manchester. But Granada apparently had branches everywhere and they bought the old Chelsea Music Hall. So there's still that vaudeville connection. And the television programme that Ellington made in uh, in February of 63, sorry, January of 63, um, was at the Chelsea Studios in London. So again, it was still Ellington in London. Um, and the particular track I've chosen, there's a, a lot of history with this number and the UK. And Ellington says a little bit about it in the introduction is a single petal of a rose. So perhaps we could we could play that track from January 1963. Let's do that. Thanks very much. The last time I was here, I had the honor of being presented to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. I was so thrilled by the beauty, the wonder, the majesty, the splendor of it all that uh, I told Her Majesty that I was sure something musical would come of it. She very, very graciously said she'd be listening. And so I wrote a suite of six numbers which were recorded, and the only record that was ever pressed, of course, is in the possession of Queen Elizabeth. We'd like to play a tune from the suite now. It's called A Single Petal of a Rose. single petal of a rose. Thank you. Uh, a very strong link to 
the UK and through the writing of the Queen's Suite. And what Ellington wouldn't perhaps have had time to say in his introduction to the piece is the, the story of its composition. The, the track we played um, from Kilburn, in fact, was on a CD you produced for the Society, Anthony. I thought, was it for Ellington? 2008. Um, oh, was it was it from indeed? a vinyl LP originally. That, <laughs> but the oh, vinyl that's L- right. <laughs> okay, yes. So, dear old Jerry Valbon um, put out yeah. a double LP for probably yeah. Oldham 88, possibly. Yes, yes, it, I believe so. And then, uh, gosh, that takes me back. Yes, yeah, and then, all so I had a copy of that. I presumably still do yeah. somewhere, and so I dubbed it and then put it out on a CD for the conference for two thousand and eight. Yeah. Yes, Gosh. At, at that conference, I think I'm right in saying one of the speakers was Earl Oakin, who was on the program, wasn't he? A few weeks. That's ago. absolutely right. Yes. And Earl Oakin was a, a, a great friend of Rene Diamond. I guess some kind of London socialite. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but the story went that Ellington held a party at her flat and bought her a baby grand piano as a present for hosting the party. And a single petal of a rose fell from the, the flowers on the piano. And Ellington created that composition on the spot. There is a recording of it. I think Earl will own that. Um, perhaps if he comes on the show again, he might be persuaded to play it. I heard part of it on a, a BBC radio programme with a little bit of a narrative from Rene Diamond telling that story. And the version that you hear on that recording certainly isn't quite the version um, that became Single Petal of a Rose. So I, I'm sure there's a great deal of truth in that, that it was actually composed in a flat in London and obviously formed a very important part of the Queen's suite subsequently. The only piece, I think, from the suite that Ellington ever played in concert throughout the rest of his lifetime. And while there were more than there was more than one pressing of the album, um, uh, the one or two got into collectors' hands. Obviously, it wasn't until after Ellington's death that Pablo released the entire suite. But Ellington was obviously quite happy to talk about that particular composition and the whole suite. Um, on national television in 1963 when there were only three channels so presumably a lot of people heard him um, telling that story so that's something about a single petal of a rose Um, I'm certainly not going to be negative right the way through this uh, (laughs) this (laughs) programme but it's something I feel very strongly about I occasionally dip into eBay you can get lots of contemporary jazz magazines um, for, for a song. This is one, I don't know if I, if I can hold that up. Oh, it's, it's reversed, actually. But this is Jazz News and Review. It, and it was, it was published on the 16th of January, 1963. It says, welcome, Duke. And it makes a big splash about this particular visit. To my horror, when I read the article inside is written by somebody called Danny Halperin, who I certainly don't wish to show any disrespect towards, but I feel he's more likely to have disappeared into obscurity than Duke Ellington. And the title of his piece, uh, if I can just find my notes for that, is The Superior Relic. So this is how he, <laughs> we've got this big welcome to, welcome to Britain, Duke. And uh, Danny Halperin wrote this piece, I'll read just part of it. Since roughly the late 1940s, after Blanton was gone and Webster too and Bigard and Cootie, the Ellington Orchestra started falling apart. The coup de grace, as far as I am concerned, was the departure of Sonny Greer, probably the most underrated big band drummer. At the departure of Ivy Anderson, Duke's best vocalist, and that of Herb Jeffries, Duke's best male ballads man, and that's that. And when you've subtracted Lawrence Brown over long stretches of time, you really arrive at something awfully close to zero. Then the glibness sets in. Again, I'm just, just yeah. amazed that that attitude, I'm sure Ellington would have disregarded it and it had no bearing on his development as an artist. But I think that he must have been an internet troll waiting for the invention of the internet, really. Um, amusingly, for some reason, I managed to get the next copy of the magazine, which is dated the 24th of January. And then Mr. Halprin writes in that, I was gassed, G-A-S-S-E-D. That must be how all the, uh, the, the cool dudes spoke in those days. I was gassed with some of the nasty and intensely personal letters that reached Jazz News after my demolition job on Duke. 
Good to know some readers care enough to vent some minor and major obscenities on your correspondent. So I'm glad <laughs> Duke had his defenders in 1963. Um, but I think to take for granted this organisation uh, coming to the UK, uh, I say, is slightly mind-boggling. <laughs> yes, indeed. So, I mean, yeah, the list of departures that he enumerated there are half not in that sequence. No. Uh, no. <laughs> so, uh, yes. Um, and beyond their control in one or two cases. Absolutely, so, yes. But yeah. that, yes. So uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't let it, you know I wouldn't let uh what other people Oh write. absolutely, yeah. Yes. It's interesting. I mean it's always interesting. Well it's not always interesting, it's sometimes interesting to read these contemporary as you say, contemporary uh, accounts and so on. Um but of course yeah. the one thing that they lack is the historical perspective. Yes. Um yeah. and so yeah. These first drafts are, you know, yes. interesting, yeah. but also interesting to be, to uh, you know, yeah. considered with other things, including, of course, fortunately, um, you know, uh, our own experience of the many sound recordings and occasional yes. videos yeah. or films. It's the, the names you mentioned, I mean, Jimmy Blanton, and particularly in view of last last week's fantastic programme um, with, with Matt, they were pioneers, weren't they? And necessarily they deserve a great deal of critical time and attention and scrutiny uh they they built the foundations upon which ellington continued to evolve it seems strange to denigrate what was the present though um by comparison to the past i think comparisons are pretty odious in any case um but it's, it's just interesting to stumble upon these rather prickly comments in the the jazz press i think not the popular press well at least here did it uh, you know Acknowledge that in the, in the further issue. Yes. In, in, yes. in that article that you've just uh, quoted from, yeah. uh, is Johnny Hodges and Harry Carney not mentioned? No, it, it just seems it, they're not. Um, it's funny that those names and when Ellington, I, I, no, I'm a bit hazy on the dates. I think Lawrence Brown would have been back with the orchestra yeah. in '63, and Cootie Williams. They were. They were both in Paris, weren't they, in February? So those illustrious names from the past were back. He does mention Lawrence Brown, but says his intermittent absences is something else to decry. Um, and I'm, 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 there are other things I've discovered in the presses. Duke is accused of not being as good as he used to be. And I think he was aware of that himself, wasn't he? He was always being compared to the past. Um, and then equally in on the 65 tour, you find comments about the inclusion of Lawrence Brown and Cootie Williams as if somehow Lawrence Brown doing the tricky Sam Nanton work on um, the, the medley of Black and Tan Fantasy is uh, that is decried because it's a heart back to the past. So poor Duke can never, it's like that story of the young man, the old man and the donkey, whoever's pulling the cart, the bystanders have an opinion and say, why are you letting the old man pull the cart or the donkey or the boy? Um, so it's interesting to look at that contemporary perspective. I think you're right, Anthony, they, they, they lack our sense of the whole span of Duke's career and he just carried on regardless. Well, I mean, certainly everybody at the time uh, used to decry the medley, you know, the dreaded mm. medley. Yeah. But I mean, we'd be delighted to listen to it now, of course. Yes, um, yeah. And again, for the, the, the general public, the medley was Ellington yeah. to them. He was oh, yeah. known for those. The songs, wasn't it, even more so than the, the, the jump numbers of the 40s, which were, they, those things were often used to market a sort of nostalgia for the swing era, weren't they? But Ellington's popular reputation drew on a decade previous to that and all of those, all those wonderful songs, yeah. Plus, plus, of course, you've got the uh, the sort of um, the Cotton Club bit in the, the medley, you know, with, um, yes. with the mooch yeah. and black and tan. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and Rocking yeah. in Rhythm was a, a regular feature, wasn't it? Did did Was that in any of the concerts you saw, Quentin, that Rocking in Rhythm was popular at that time? I, I can't remember whether he played no. Rocking in Rhythm. It seems yeah. very likely he did. I mean, certainly yeah. it was in the programme at the 1969 yes. tour. Yeah. 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 Oh, he was back in '64, regardless of the, uh, regardless of some of the, the critics' comments, and that was a. I, I find a particularly fascinating year, 1964. Um, I think the orchestra arrived uh, in the UK on the 14th 
of February on Valentine's Day, hence thinking my funny Valentine would be a good choice from 58. Uh, and I, I, certainly I know members of the band were here on the 14th of February because there is a recording from Ronnie Scott's club of Pat Anderson and Rolf Erickson, both of whom are in the brass section in 64, sitting in with the Tubby Hayes quintet. Um, I, I'm really reliant on the, the superb scholarship of Simon Spillett, the tenor saxophonist, and he's in his mid-40s, I think, a young man, um, absolutely steeped in the history of jazz generally, British jazz in particular. And I learned from him, and he wrote a biography of Tubby Hayes called The Long Shadow of the Little Giant, that Tubby Hayes came into Ellington's orbit in 1958, I guess via concerts like the uh, the one in at the Gaumont in Kilburn, and got to know Paul Gonsalves, who sat in with Tubby Hayes and Ronnie Scott when they ran the Jazz Couriers, the, the, the band that they ran together, before Ronnie Scott perhaps started his famous club. Um, so um, the, the members of the Ellington Orchestra would certainly have been aware of particularly the modern jazz scene in the UK and in London in particular. And on Valentine's night in 1964, Cat Anderson and uh, Rolf Erickson, as I say, sat in with the Tubby Hayes um, quintet <coughs> uh, for a couple of numbers. And a recording of that was made um, by one of the um, regulars in the club. So we'd be able to, to drop in on that, that session the night before Ellington's UK tour was supposed to begin. Um, the, the Tubby Hayes Quintet, and I, I don't have the names off the top of my head, so I just need to double check these, um, was uh, Alan Ganley on drums, uh, Freddie Logan on bass, Jimmy Duker on guitar. Uh, to my shame, I've not just jotted down the, the pianist. Uh, sorry. Jimmy Duker would have been playing trumpet. Yeah, tr trumpet. I don't know why I've not... Louis Stewart, maybe. Maybe, yeah. Um, but Rolf Erickson and Cat Anderson sat in on, on a standard meme to me. The track lasts for 16 minutes, so even an extract, it's still eight minutes, the, the, the bit I've chosen. It gives us a chance to hear Cat Anderson, again, not in a high note mode, but on a, on a, a well-known standard, mean to me. Um, so Cat plays some. Uh, Rolf Erickson, I think, follows up. He's there on flugelhorn at some point for this track, and we get to hear Tubby. Uh, if any non-UK viewers, I mean, his, his reputation was worldwide, but a, a tenor saxophonist, a modernist, uh, a child prodigy, brilliant on his instrument at 15, um, as I say, was in the jazz careers with Ronnie Scott prior to becoming a, a, a solo act, a major figure in, in British jazz history and a, a significant part in Ellington's story, as we'll see. So this is uh, Ronnie Scott's Club um, on the 14th of February, 1964. The voice you hear just mentioning the Duke Ellington Orchestra is Ronnie Scott himself, and he introduces them. And we'll hear a little bit of um, members of the Ellington band sitting in with the Tubby Hayes Quintet. The Duke Ellington Orchestra, Cat Anderson. A big hand for Tubby Hayes and Cat Anderson. <laughs>
section there of Mean to Me from Ronnie Scott's 14th of February 1963. 64. <laughs> Take two. Les Tompkins recording Mean to Me there, <laughs> Ronnie Scott's in 1964. Thank you. Um, that was lovely, wasn't it? Wonderful stuff. And you're saying that there's another half of that that we haven't heard. Yes. <laughs> so people can go and find that if they wish to. Yeah. Oh, it's fantastic. on the Candid label. Yeah. Thank you. Oh dear, yes, 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 you mentioned that they got the terrible review in 63, but it didn't stop them coming back. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. We've had a terrible review, but we're going to continue anyway. Yes. Um, <laughs> I don't, I, 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 yes. Well, I mean, look, not everything that Ellington did is equally brilliant, of course, and so it's valid yeah. to have criticism and so on, but 
you know, from a historical perspective, and particularly moaning about how people had left more than 20 years before, and in some cases because they'd died or become seriously ill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it does seem a little bit, uh, a little bit yes. vague, actually, a little bit lacking yes. in historical knowledge. Um, but perhaps the, you know, the intricacies of things. I mean, Sunny Grid didn't leave till much, much later. Um, oh. But uh, yes, and he was replaced by a very noisy and very different drummer, yes. of course. Uh, which does upset some people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but then he was replaced by a much uh, gentler person. So, anyway, okay, righty ho. Um, where are we going now? Shall we, shall we talk a little bit about, uh, since we have Mike and Quentin here, uh, their experiences of seeing Duke in the 1960s? Hmm. So, Mike, you said that you saw Duke in 58, but then later in Sheffield. Well, uh, yes, because. Um... Uh, I was still an apprentice then, so uh, uh, I just finished an apprenticeship. So uh, uh, I obviously didn't go very far to follow any jazz stars that were available. I mean, Manchester's roughly 35 miles away. So to go to places like the Free Trades Hall that uh, Ian mentioned would would well, now is not a problem, but then it was a kind of surmountable, insurmountable <laughs> mountain. Uh, uh, but yes, the, the venue in Sheffield for most of the visiting jazz stars, including people like um, uh, there was a jazz at the Philharmonic uh, uh, concert that was presented. Uh, and to me, certainly at the time, one of the interesting uh, aspects of that and I know this is not Ellington but I think it's um, indicative of the kind of venue that it was they all played the City Hall and, and on this Jazz at the Phil concert that came um, the pianist had to be replaced by Phineas Newborn because uh, it might have been Red Garland who kind of um, f faded out of the scene for illness apparently and really to hear Phineas, or Finus as he preferred to be called, play the piano was something else. Um, the majority of people who came visiting Sheffield and who played the City Hall were very fortunate because just across, and by just across, I mean less than 100 paces away, was the Grand Hotel, which is where they were all stayed. But the downside of that was that it was very difficult to mix with stars in those days because all they had to do was to really dash across the road and they were in the sanctuary of the hotel and invariably there were security people so you could hang around for ages and not see very much uh, which was a kind of scene that very much changed in the 80s, 90s, and subsequently, I mean, it's been relatively easy to meet up with stars, I, I've, I've felt. I think the point that um, you uh, uh, referred to, Anthony, about uh, the critics, um, it seems to me that even from the 30s when Ellington came to Britain, there'd be some aspect of Ellington that did not suit somebody who uh, apparently appeared to be a fan of uh, Duke's work uh, but found some criticism. The fact that the drummer had changed, as you mentioned, uh, and even in uh, the 30s visits, um, if you study the sparse number of magazines that related to uh, writing about jazz, and I'm thinking now of... Um, uh, one that um, Leonard Hibbs did, uh, there were even complaints about Ellington actually visiting uh, London. And, and in fact, it might be interesting to dig that article out sometime. Um, the, one of the problems with the City Hall in Sheffield at the time was that uh, right in the middle of the stage and kind of uh, at the top of a staircase went, which went down into the bowels of the City Hall, and to where the dressing rooms were, were two monster stone lions, which kind of upset the layout of any large group that was attempted to play there. So sometimes the, the sounds were a bit 
awkward. I mean, it's quite a good haul as far as acoustics are concerned. But the fact that you had to um, place the drums on one side of the lions and the bass player um, and the piano on the other side uh, did make for a bit of peculiar listening. However, that, that was uh, not just applicable to Ellington. Uh, the best memory I have of Ellington was, as I mentioned, and I, I showed you this poster, which mm. might not have been seen, <coughs> um, which was at the uh, Odeon Theatre, and we've made the point that that really was a cinema foremost and a theatre secondary, and, and a lot of jazz stars, and it seemed to me when I read the press about these visits that... Um, Particularly in London, it seemed to be the case, um, despite the large number of public uh, uh, venues for music, frequently cinemas were used to present these uh, shows. Um, what is interesting is down here, where my finger is, it shows the prices of the seats. It mentions <laughs> two concerts, 6.40pm and 9pm. Uh, and if you wanted a ticket to get to the Odeon Theatre for this particular show, you could get one for eight shillings, ten and sixpence, thirteen and sixpence, sixteen and sixpence. And if you were really flush, you had to fork out 21 shillings to get to that, that concert. Goodness me. It's a, it's a um, guinea. A guinea, yes. A, a guinea, absolutely. <laughs> and... Um, the only time that I remember um, the musicians in the Ellington Orchestra on these visits uh, really being accessible were, as I say, um, photographs like uh, that, mm. which shows Ellington here, of course, yeah, down in the centre, and... Um, a rather more, not very good photograph. I'm afraid. I, I didn't take these. I'll explain about them in a minute. Pull uh, back a little uh, bit, Mike. Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and the reason I got these photographs was because the lady you can see with the glasses on to the side of Ellington is my yeah. sister-in-law. <laughs> and um, her husband was a chemist uh, a, a chemist in the sense that he had um, two or three chemist shops. So it was quite easy for him to get to the um, uh, press conference. Uh, and he took the photographs, not very well, but not very good ones, but at least they, they were there. Cool. There was some meeting of uh, fans and uh, the uh, musicians actually at the concert, which was a conventional concert. I mean, I'm sure that the uh, performance of the actual tunes selected would be the same, whether it was in Leicester or Manchester or London. I don't think they changed the um, fare of the presentation that very much. But um, uh, I do remember that uh, there was a number of people trying to get backstage to this uh, Odeon concert, including friends that we had uh, in Glasgow uh, but the security was ultra secure as it were mm. uh, and um, th there was no encouragement to mix with the musicians and I'm not mm. conscious of the musicians going and jamming with anybody if, if indeed and there, there weren't mm. that many venues for concerts sorry for sessions in the centre of Glasgow as I remember it in those days and it seems to me that, you know, when, for example, um, we used to trek down from Glasgow to see who was playing at the Manchester Sports Guild. I don't know whether Ian ever went there at all. No, I don't. Not familiar with that. Uh, yeah. Which was near the cathedral in, in Manchester. Uh, but it seemed to me that in those days, which would be 60s and 70s, that when the likes of Pee Wee Russell or... Red Allen were playing with uh, uh, in, in these cities, that it seemed a lot easier to mix with people. But uh, mm -hmm. with the Ellington folk, uh, the, the click that uh, 
sort of was in the in the know was round a guy called Nori Mike Swan. Now, oh. Nori Mike Swan was a doctor, a, 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 a surgeon kind of doctor. And um, uh, he seemed to be able to, as it were, not gate crash, but get involved. I, I presume he invited a number of these musicians uh, back to his um, rather palatial um, domestic circumstances. And it is suggested, and I don't know how uh, uh, much this is um, uh, true, but with, with particular members of the Ellington Orchestra, if they were, uh, shall we say, hanging out a little at the time, then Norrie Mike Swan was in a position to uh, help them along the road, as it were. So that might have been ah. uh, perhaps a useful asset. Uh, not that he, not that the aforementioned Mr. Mike, or Dr. Mike Swan, as I should say, uh, was just linked with Ellington. He was a great mate of um, uh, Humphrey Littleton's and uh, was influen influential in, in some of the books that um, uh, Humph wrote. Um, the other occasion when Ellington, but not the Ellington Orchestra, visited Sheffield was in 1948. And we did have a, a member of the society, uh, a guy called Ron Lawson. Uh, he was somewhat older than I am. And he actually went and had a long discussion with Ellington when he did the vaudeville act along with Kay um, Davis and uh, Ray Nance. Uh, at the Empire Theatre, which was part of the uh, Moss Empire Group. There were Empire Theatres all over Britain, of course, in those days. Um, a bit like the Grand Hotel in Sheffield, long since demolished. The uh, Empire Theatre survived the bombs, but didn't survive the Wreckers' Ball when this suddenly decided to do undevelop the city centre. <laughs> It seemed quite developed at the time. Anyway, uh, Ron Lawson had a quite a long discussion with with, with Ellington, and I think somewhere in the um, Blue Light Annals, uh, his discussion is recorded. I'll, I'll try and look that out and see if we can resurrect it again. Um, but uh, yeah, it was an exciting time to go and see these concerts, and uh, um, uh, well. To have Duke Ellington on the stage, uh, some perhaps 25 yards from where you were sitting, yeah. uh, was an excitement. I mean, that's something I've had with, yes. with all the jazz, certainly in those days, perhaps less so as time went on. But in those days, uh, to see uh, these stars that you had worshipped on record was a really, mm. really uh, mm. exciting thing to do. It was, yeah. uh, and funnily yeah. enough, Mentioning, uh, as I did, the um, Manchester Free Trades Hall, and certainly not connected with Ellington, uh, I remember uh, there was a series of blues concerts there, and I could not believe my eyes when who should saunter onto the stage was Sleepy John Estes, who was a blues singer I'd heard when I was a teenager, and I thought he was 100 years older than I was when I heard those records. <laughs> But to actually see him and the and the other people as well, um, and similarly with Herman or um, Mulligan or Dizzy Gillespie, it, it really was an exciting thing to do. Uh, apart from enjoying the music, physically being in contact mm. with people in that way yeah. was something out of the ordinary, and they are memories yeah. that I certainly will um, treasure for a long time, and I suspect other people do as well. Yeah. I imagine, Mike, that you know, however high the fi of the records, there can't be a, a similar experience to hearing the music live. Um, uh, uh, no, uh, uh, and, and I think one of the reasons for that is that, uh, uh, and, and I think this certainly applies to most musicians, it certainly doesn't apply to all musicians, but it has, applies to most musicians, when you see them live, and, and I suspect they're doing this in the um, confines of a recording studio as well, but 
there is a physical presence. You mm. see the, the way they um, excite themselves, if you like, with the music or seem to be particular, particularly pleased with a phrase or, or a note that they, that they come. That is not possible to uh, enjoy when you're listening no. to a disc or, or a record, but to see it gives an extra boost to the performance. Um, and, and sometimes, uh, and again, you don't see this, um, perhaps they drop a piece of, uh, of, uh, of the score from their uh, um, music stand uh, and the problem they have in picking it up and then finding the place again. Mm. All, all that is part of the performance. Yeah. I, I know it's inconsequential and is not to do with the actual performance itself, but it is part of seeing these uh, concerts that you go to. Thank you, Mike. Fantastic. Ian, what shall we hear next? Well, um, although he he didn't sit in on that occasion with the, the Tubby Hayes group, um, Paul Gonsalves must have picked up with the group shortly after they left Ronnie's on the night of the 14th of February. They, must have, they all made rather merry. And <laughs> unfortunately, Paul was unable to report for duty the next day. The next day, the 15th of February, was the beginning of quite an extensive tour of the UK by Ellington, and they were playing the Royal Festival Hall. And Paul was uh, indisposed. Um, and Tubby Hayes and Jimmy Duker, the night before, had said they would go and see Ellington at the Royal Festival Hall. But And the next morning, I think they were all a little the worse for wear. I think Tubby could handle his drink rather better than Paul Gonsalves. He still thought, well, I'm not sure whether I want to go or not, but they decided they would go along to the Royal Festival Hall to see uh, the Ellington performance. Because they knew members of the orchestra, they went backstage before the concert and, and discovered that they were a, a tenor saxophone player down. And um, so um, Ellington asked if... Tubby would be prepared to take that on. Somebody called Dougie Tobert, apparently, was the road manager for the Harold Davison Agency. And I think he was the, the go-between. Tubby should have been appearing at Ronnie Scott's again that night, but Ronnie Scott very generously sent Tubby's tenor to the Royal Festival Hall in a taxi. And Tubby was able to... Uh, there were two houses, as you said, Quentin. I think that was part of Duke's contract, that there was never more than two shows in a day. So for the first house... Um, the tenor was sent by taxi to the Royal Festival Hall and um, Tubby was able to sneak on after the performance had started in the best tradition, I think, of some of the Ellingtonians um, and took part in the concert. Jimmy Hamilton uh, was particularly helpful, um, so I believe, for Tubby in working his way through the music. While he was waiting for his saxophone to arrive, Billy Strayhorn set the music up for, for Tubby. Um, so it's quite a, a legendary night because Tubby is such a, a legend himself. To have these two legends coincide is uh, a, a really astounding thing. There is a, a recording from the second house, which we're going to dip into now. Um, it's Dean Benedetti, Charlie Parker type quality, unfortunately, but it's such a priceless um, occasion. It was never repeated. Tubby was an Ellingtonian for one night only. I thought it was well worth hearing. Um, so we're going to listen to the opener. Uh, you can just about hear Duke <coughs> before the, 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 the song starts. And I'd not realised until I was preparing the material for this that the number came into the band with Cootie Williams. Um, Duke uses an expression like he, he brought it with him. So whether he was the composer or not of the opener, I'm not sure. It became a vehicle for Paul Gonsalves and featured on the Concert in the Virgin Islands album a year later. There was a studio recording. And um, so Tubby fits very well into the, that, that space that would have been occupied by Gonsalves. As I said, I've never really had a lot of time for this as, as a number. It is a sort of a big band stomper. And dreadful though the quality of the recording is, it was made by a member of the audience. I, I understand a lot better the excitement that that particular chart generates. And you really do hear the brass section bouncing off the walls and Sam Woodyard's drums sort of clashing around the auditorium. 
the response to Tubby's solo from the audience is very enthusiastic. Um, and at the, um, Buster Cooper takes a solo and Kat Anderson again at the end, who just the night before was sitting in in Ronnie's. Um, there's a huge applause at the end of the number and Duke grants Tubby uh, an encore. So they, they go through the end of the, 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 the sequence again and Tubby is able then to play uh, a, a further extemporization on the on the saxophone so it's it's just tremendous it's like he's dropping on eternity really to to hear that this recording survives so apologies for the sound quality but this is from the 15th of february the second house at the royal festival hall and the duke ellington orchestra uh, with tubby hayes on the opener <laughs>
Duke Ellington at the Royal Festival Hall on London South Bank. With Tubby Hayes. Yeah, I think the, the, the bit at the end that's just about audible is Tubby Hayes also wants you to know he too loves you madly. <laughs> Must be like getting a benediction from the Pope. I think. <laughs> but it's a lovely way of finishing that, that little bit. I think Tubby had a, a solo in Harlem as well, which is obviously the subject of a, a program a couple of weeks ago, um, which which exercised him. But he acquitted himself I think, with flying colours, and certainly um, Johnny Hodges, Harry Carney, uh, w- went on record afterwards as saying uh, what a good job he'd made. Uh, and Ellington said, "You just thought he'd have made a rehearsal." So <laughs> it was a bit hurried. <laughs> I do have a. A, quote, a, a quotation, if that's good, just to drop in maybe with Quentin's reminiscences yes. about a performance at the Royal Festival Hall, but in 1965. This is somebody called George Ellis, writing for a mag- who I, I don't know much about, unfortunately, writing for Jazz Beat. But his reminiscence, although I've never attended an Ellington um, concert, what he describes, that sense of anticipation, if you're there before curtain up, I guess... Um, People feel particularly if you're invested in the artists who are appearing. And he wrote, there is something very extra special about seeing Duke Ellington and his orchestra at the Festival Hall, particularly if you take your seat before the commencement. To me, it is always a great thrill to see various members of the orchestra, most of whom are by now familiar faces, strolling on in groups of twos and threes, and to listen to the audience reaction as individual favourites are uh, reorganised. Procope, Cat and Buster Cooper, Carney and Mercer Ellington, Hodges, Cootie, Ray, Lawrence, Herbie, Sam, on they come, and who is going to be last? Jimmy Hamilton smiling broadly at his own unplanned scene stealing. That's a lovely image of before the concert starts. Uh, I don't know if that tuned in with your anticipation, Quentin, of seeing Ellington in concert. Oh, yeah, totally, especially the first time in 1969, which is the first with Now, I remember them coming on drips and drabs, mm-hmm. and then um, they all sat down. And it was Harry Carney who stood up, looked around, tapped his foot, yeah. And then they blasted into uh, Sea Jam Blues. Wow. And um, you know, the Sam just, <laughs> well, yeah. for me, it was just amazing. Yes. I loved yeah. it. Yeah. You, you saw the, the very last um, appearance of Ellington, didn't you, in the UK in 73? Yeah, and, at, the, and at the Rainbow. It. Yeah. That was at the Rainbow. Which, uh, I don't, yeah. don't know what it was called before that, in Three Park. Yes. Yeah. Strange place. It was a rock uh, venue, and uh, I was a bit dubious about going to, at all because by that time, yeah, and it was very much towards the end of the Ellington era. I didn't go, for example, to um, to the Westminster, yes, um, you know, yeah. Westminster Abbey, which is the um, yeah uh, the the, um, the spiritual thing. Mm. The sacred concept which was um, was that a few months earlier or even the previous October, year? I think October. Yeah. Yeah. So when when yeah. was the appearance at the Rainbow? <coughs> uh, I think it was early seventy three. Was it? I can't really remember. I mean, certainly by the time I, I was going, um, the the annual thing of uh, early in the year that was that had gone by the board. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yes. Because uh, I mean, sixty nine, seventy one. We're both in November, certainly sixty nine yeah. was. Uh, yeah. but, but the last time, 73, that was, um, I mean, it was, it's quite a famous occasion in some ways because of, because uh, Paul Gonzalez was, I mean, you know, he, he, he didn't treat himself very well. No. But uh, Duke loved him, the people loved him. And uh, at that final concert, uh, he played a, a very famous version of Happy Reunion. Mm-hmm. And Duke... Um, going to come and play and to move deliberately away from the microphone. I mean, Paul Gonzalez was never the loudest tenor saxophone player, yeah. but he had a beautiful sound and it really filled the auditorium. It was, um, it was a very moving and beautiful moment. And um, yeah. I mean, uh, I think the whole audience knew it's something special. Certainly it's, um, I mean, I've heard Mike Westbrook talk about it. Mm. And I think one of our other members, uh, 
Graham Columbine claims some credit for uh, exhorting Duke to uh, to do this for Paul. Uh, it was a great moment. Certainly something yeah, I won't forget. Terrific. Yeah. And even, even in his absence in 64, he was a presence and uh, he was back the <laughs> next night and, and took part in the, the rest of the tour in 64. That's, yeah. Incredible. Did he even go home after that trip, that 73 trip? Yeah. Um, he, he, he um, was staying with Jackie Sharp. Who, so he did die in the UK. He died in the UK, and, yeah, and his, his body was flown back to the US, I believe. When you said, um, Mike, about uh, the, the person in Sheffield who was kind of on the inside track and a, 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 felicit a facilitator, Jackie Sharp looked after musicians when they were in London and he was um, an associate of, uh, of, of, of Tubby Hayes. Uh, he appeared on a couple of records with Paul Gonzalez, including one of the ones I was going to move on to next. And I think, in fact, paid to have them recorded. Um, and the, the the album we featured when we looked at Paul's work last July, uh, Boom Jackie Boom Chip was named after Jackie Sharp. So I think he was staying with Jackie Sharp um, uh, at the end of his life. Um, but Jackie Sharp paid for uh, four albums um, to be recorded in London with Paul Gonsalves, two of which were with... Um, um, Toby Hayes the, the final one was Kenny Wheeler again just re researching ahead of looking at Ellington in the UK a couple of compositions um, were, were recorded by um, Desert Member in Leeds uh, or uh, a senior moment has stolen upon me Tony Faulkner Tony Fa thanks Quentin yeah Tony Faulkner actually wrote a couple of numbers for Paul Gonsalves in his for his, his last UK album. So again, the talent and the expertise and the experience residing amongst desert members is uh, incredible. You, know, you mentioned Mike Westbrook as well, Quentin. Um, but the, 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 the two albums that Paul recorded with um, Tubby Hayes, that, that was an, in 64 and 65. The first one, which was called Just Friends, was recorded... 10 days after Tubby's appearance with the orchestra at the Royal Festival Hall. And I have a track from that, if uh, we're OK to, to move on to that. Uh, uh, I don't, don't know how we are for time or um, Anthony. Time is passing, but we're all right for that. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll try and get through the Tubby tracks, if, if nothing else. Um, the, the, the track I've chosen from the album is called Pedro's Walk, Tubby had a big band as well as working in smaller groups. And a couple of months after this album was recorded, he recorded a, an album with his big band called Tubbs Tours. And Pedro's Walk is a, a, um, a number that was featured on that. Um, it was written by Ian Hamer, a British trumpet player, um, and someone who'd worked extensively with Tubby. Uh, in the orchestra on this occasion, Jimmy Duker again, um, Les Condon, who also wrote music for, for Tubby and Paul, Keith Christie on trombone, Jackie Sharp on baritone sax, um, Lenny Bush on bass, Ronnie Stevenson drums, and the great Stan Tracy on piano, who a, a real luminary of the British scene and accompanist to Ben Webster at Ronnie Scott's on several occasions. So this is from the album Just Friends. This is Paul Gonsalves united now with his friend Tubby Hayes uh, and the track Pedro's Walk from that album. Thank you. 
Pedro's walk there. Yeah, Toby and Paul united. We were chatting um, amongst ourselves there for a moment. Yeah. When um, the orchestra returned again in 65, and um, I don't know whether it was a coincidentally or not, but the, the, ne- the second album that Paul and Toby recorded together, which is called Change of Setting, uh, was recorded on the exact an- first anniversary of Tubby's appearance with the Ellington Orchestra at the Royal Festival Hall. So I think it was just a, a one-day session. Um, these albums were recorded at the Lansdowne Studios, um, Holland Park. I, I imagine the luxury apartments now, as-, as anything that's left for five minutes in London is <laughs> turned into these days. Um, but it was recorded at the Lansdowne Studios. Um, the, the track I've chosen from that album is called Min and Madge Blues. It sounds like a couple of old uh, old ladies. It's minor and major, I think, is the joke. Written by Les Condon, again, another, um, uh, I think, a trumpet player and an associate of Tubby. Uh, I've chosen this particular track for, for many reasons. Tony Coe, a great luminary of the British scene and a real um, admirer of Gonsalves' tenor work, is featured briefly, I think, right at the end of the track. Ronnie Scott is playing on this track as well, uh, Jackie Sharp. There is Terry Shannon, uh, Ronnie Stevenson. A couple of, uh, of Ellingtonians, John Lamb, if we have time to play the next couple of tracks, love to talk a little who you would have met, I guess, Quentin and Frank played with, didn't he, at the conference in 2008. John Lamb on bass. Um, Ray Nance is back. Ray Nance left the Ellington Orchestra towards the end of 1963, but worked with the Ellington Orchestra um, for several months in 1965. Partly, I wonder, because Duke um, resurrected Black, Brown and Beige during that period and played it at the White House and, uh, and recorded various movements um, from it, which was subsequently issued on the private collection so ray is playing trumpet on this track just the the one track he solos on uh, as, a, as a trumpeter but it was great that he was back with the orchestra for their british tour in 65 so this is from the the first anniversary of tubby's becoming an honorary ellingtonian on the 15th of february from the album change of setting um min and madge blues Thank you. 
Min and Madge Blues there. I think. Yeah, from 1960, yeah, from 1965 yes. and the album Change of Setting. Yeah, uh, with special guest appearance of Ray Nance. Um, the day after that, the 16th of February, uh, Ellington was um, rehearsing for a BBC broadcast. I, I, I'm assuming it would have been in Hammersmith and the Riverside Theatre, just because I think that's where um, a, a great deal of the um, light entertainment of the BBC uh, was was put together, a fairly sizable theatre. Um, as I think I said earlier, Ellington was on television every year during the mid-60s, either on ITV or BBC. In 64, he'd almost opened BBC Two for business with an appearance on the Jazz 625 programme. I think Ellington was the first... Um, artist to be featured on that series. It was a sort of precursor to the actual series, yeah, special with Ellington on the air. Right, right, yeah. Um, and in 65, um, the BBC spent two nights on a programme called Ellington in Europe, which was a combination of footage of the orchestra on its travels um, and some numbers that they'd recorded specifically, um, at, I presume, at the Riverside Studios. Uh, on the 16th of February, Ellington and the orchestra were rehearsing for uh, for that show. It was directed by Yvonne Littlewood, who mm. had also directed yes, right. um, for uh, Ellington a year earlier, and she's still 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 with us, um, I believe. Um, and she directed the studio sessions for that particular broadcast. The prowling cat that we heard at the beginning of the um, program was from those sessions and I have a couple of tracks now if we have time for those the, as I said these are, are rehearsal recordings and the bass comes out particularly clearly I'm pleased to say on these so we, we get to hear quite some quite extensive work from John Lamb I mentioned Buster Cooper earlier um, as having a solo in the opener uh, the year before and Buster and John Lamb were both guests weren't they Anthony I think at the uh, at the conference in 2008 that's right yes yeah. Um, so um, John Lamb is featured particularly strongly here. Um, I, I, the impression I get from the library that Ellington presented in the 60s was it would be a, a mixture of the, the medley, which uh, audiences came to expect, um, nods to the past, um, features from albums, though, of course, some albums were never really played live. Sinclair Trail, the editor of Jazz Journal at the time, I think was rather bothered that the 65 tour would consist of performances from the album Ellington 65, <laughs> but, but they weren't touched. But the big number for 1965 was Adlib on Nippon. Um, a, a year previously, the Middle Eastern part of the Far East suite had featured heavily in the programming at um, the Royal Festival Hall. There's a nice double CD of Ellington at Carnegie Hall in 64, playing pretty much the Royal Festival Hall program and several tracks from the, the, um, from the, the Middle Eastern section of, I think what was called originally Impressions of the Far East. Ellington visited Japan towards the end of 19, I think towards the end of 64, uh, and parts of Adlib on Nippon were composed fairly speedily after that, and one part appeared on a, a an airline travel commercial. By early 65, the entire number had been put together, and I think it possibly premiered in Paris in 65 and Ellington featured it on his concert tour in 65 and on Ellington in Europe. So we have a rehearsal here of um, a very early version of Adlib on Nippon. For some reason, there's five seconds radio silence. I don't know if they were changing the tapes, um, Fargo style. I know it was discs back in Fargo. There is a gap, but rather than try to edit that, that, that there is a silence, but we get to hear uh, all four movements uh, of, of the piece. Uh, I always find Ellington's piano really moving. Um, is it the Nagoya section, I think, of Adlib on Nippon? And there is extensive work for um, Jimmy Hamilton in the final section. I think Jimmy Hamilton claimed composer credit, at least for that, that part of the number. And some wonderful, rich, warm, strong bass from John Lamb, which the recording picks up really clearly. So this was a rehearsal, I think, in Hammersmith, on the 16th of February, 1965, um, and Adlib on Nippon. The Japan, 
We uh, naturally were exposed to all of the mystery and beauty of the Orient, and as a result of which we came up with a thing that we now call ad lib on Nippon.
The bass is John Lamb. Thank you very much for Jimmy Hamilton, John Lamb. And now, and now yeah. Duke Ellington, 1965, on yes. a rehearsal. Yeah, um, a small, but I'm sure appreciative audience in yes, the studio. Yes, yeah. Well, that was yeah. reminiscent of the sort of audience that uh, shows, TV shows have at the moment. Uh, a few people, a few, a few <laughs> yes. staffers just sitting at the back of the studio clapping, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wonder whether John Lamb heard that. You know, it's, it's really, I'm sure he'd love to hear Yes. It. Yeah. Or maybe he's yeah, watching. That's a thought. Yeah. Okay. Lovely. Yeah, that, it, um, I think it featured quite heavily in concerts throughout the uh, throughout '65, and I must say, um, burrowing as I have done through all these jazz magazines, the most prescient and illuminating comment I read on Adlib on Nippon was no other than a young man called Brian Priestley, who oh, yes. caught the or caught the orchestra in Bournemouth in 1965, and wrote a, a superb piece which I I discovered. Um, in my travels through these these magazines and Brian also it's very interesting to read picked up very appreciatively on the extracts of black brown and beige that were featured in the concerts and of course he went on to be involved in recording the full work himself and he it's such a, a relief to read someone who knows what they're talking about and he, very illuminating on Adlib on Nippon and those extracts yeah that's the one Quentin yeah uh, and, and those extracts from Black, Brown and Beige. It was almost two years, wasn't it, before Ellington went into the studio to record the Far East Suite. So it had quite a long gestation um, on the road. And, and the, the last track of the main programme I've got from the same occasion, um, appropriately enough, I, I, I thought was really Chelsea Bridge. And this version for Paul Gonsalves uh, was new to the book, I think in 65, and was recorded again for the Virgin Islands album a few months later. Um, and this again is for the, um, the BBC broadcast Ellington in Europe. Um, I think Ellington remarked several times that his concerts were principally to allow the musicians to demonstrate their solo responsibilities, didn't he? Um, and uh, that was certainly the case in, a, in the, the programmes that he brought to London and, and to the UK. Um, listening to these tracks over and over again, as well as the, the wonderful um, vintage Gonsalves ballad style, um, again, what the orchestra is doing behind the soloist as well is is always w worth being really finely attuned to, isn't it? So I thought Strayhorn's Chelsea Bridge uh, would be a, a perfect way of finishing a, a, a brief consideration of um, the music Ellington and his orchestra recorded uh, in the UK capital. Paul Gonsalves returns now in another Billy Strayhorn composition, Chelsea Bridge. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, an audience reminiscent of the audiences that we've had on television programmes lately. Um, seems perhaps just a few members of the crew there uh, clapping along at the rehearsal for a uh, recording for a broadcast, if that makes sense, I think, in 1965 that Ian's brought along here. Thank you so much for being here, Ian. Oh, thanks Wonderful. for inviting me again. Um, now, Ian was for several years editor of the Society's Journal, it says right there. The Journal of the Duke Ellington Society UK, which I'm turning the wrong way. There we go. This is an issue of a couple of issues ago, I think. And uh, Mike Coates, thank you so much for being here, Mike, who's left us. Uh, terrific reminiscences from him. Uh, he's our current chairman uh, as well. If you would like more information, I'll put this card up actually while the last piece plays. Um, please do go to our website. And if you're not a member, please join, in which case you will be sent four or maybe three of these uh, wonderful magazines in this coming year. I think four, probably. And uh, have the joy of being part of this wonderful association. <laughs> um, if you really would like to, you could even donate to the programme specifically by going to the web address that I put up in a moment, dukeellington.org.uk, and that would be much appreciated to help to cover our costs. Ah, oh, Ian, wonderful to see you. Thank you so much uh, for being here Thank you. and for putting Thank together you. this programme yeah. around Ellington in London. And, you know, yeah. We've touched on Ellington elsewhere in the United yeah. Kingdom as well. So that's marvellous. Yes. What are we going to hear to finish with? Uh, just a track to finish with from the Change of Setting album again, as well as being a tenor saxophonist, composer, arranger. Tubby Hayes was a fairly mean vibraphonist, vibraphone player. And it's the vibraphone, vibraphone he plays on this track. Notable as well for Ray Nance on violin. Um, um, Paul Gonsalves, of course, on tenor. To me, this track is redolent of the swinging 60s, which just happened to be getting going in the mid-60s, I think. Uh, it kind of mini cars and Carnaby Street and the Italian job, and it's a real 60s sound to it. Uh, the track was written by uh, Les Condon again, and it's called Speedy Gonsalves. Speedy Gonsalves. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, Ian. And we'll be back next week with Frank Griffith uh, and Sebastian Scottney. <laughs>